All right, thank you so much. We're gonna start uh, right away because we wanna take advantage of you being here and to get the most information we can to bring back to each of the four leaders. Um, we're gonna, today, right now, we're gonna particularly focus on the issues of coverage and, and how a lot of times people discuss this issue of cost and coverage as though they're two separately moving trains and they're not interconnected and that you can do one without the other. And it's our belief, and more importantly, the belief of the four senators, that you have to do both together and there's very substantial reasons why. So, for example, how do you do prevention well? How do you do chronic care management well? How do you do insurance reforms at all if you don't find a way to cover everyone? How do you eliminate cost shifting if you have to keep providing uncompensated care? All these issues, I think, are critically important for us, and this, this uh, panel is designed to begin to address this issue. We're going to first start, uh, of course, with Mr. Clayton McWhorter, who, as many of you know in this room, is, is, is a great, great uh, a health reform expert, and he recently founded a new organization called Shout America. Is this right? To mobilize college students to become more involved in the health reform debate. We've seen a lot more college students get involved in a lot of debates lately, and he'll provide us his insight on the importance of comprehensive health reform that includes improvements to both health care delivery and coverage, and provide ideas for how we can make progress on both fronts. I'm going to introduce you all right now so we can go straight down the line. And I guess at the outside, I would really ask you to try to can keep your remarks to five minutes so that we can really engage in, a, in some give and take questions. Uh, we'll then turn uh, to a quick history lesson uh, from Dave Getz, uh, Tennessee's Commissioner of Finance, who certainly um, can share a lot, uh, particularly lessons from the state's 10 care health insurance initiative, one that I'm well aware of. Uh, next we have uh, Dr. Robert Mandel with Blue Cross Blue Shield Tennessee who will highlight the work his health plan is doing to improve, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong order, quality of health care and ensure that more individuals are covered by health insurance. And again, that gets to this whole issue of, and I want to commend you all for the, the recent uh, national embrace of the full integration of coverage with appropriate insurance reforms. Um, Marlon Chapman with Nissan uh, North America will then discuss steps his company have taken uh, uh, to improve quality and control cost so they can remain competitive while continuing to offer health benefits. Certainly, uh, we cannot see, and then when I was talking at the very beginning of this forum, this issue of our ability to compete both domestically and internationally if we don't deal with the issue of cost and value. And we're going to hear specifically more about consumers' needs and concerns with health insurance coverage from three speakers, each offering their own unique perspective on the issue. Tony Garr, uh, the executive director of the Tennessee Health Care Campaign, uh, will discuss how ensuring Americans have coverage can improve value in the health system. Uh, we also have uh, Cynthia uh, Wayne Scott, former chair of the Mental Health America, who will discuss how health insurance coverage can improve outcomes for individuals living with chronic illness. Again, really important point here. How do you uh, thoughtfully, if, if the big focal point of our cost drivers in this system is the prevention of and care for the chronically ill, if we don't find a better way to deal with these issues, it doesn't matter what we're doing, we're not going to be able to sustain our current cost trends, let alone improve the type of quality that we want to see. Um, uh, we also have uh, Patrick Willard, the Associate Director of ARP Tennessee, who will highlight the important role health coverage has for early retirees. This is another important issue, 55 to 64, as Nancy Ann Mentaparl sends her best, uh, another Tennessee uh, alum. And lastly, to round out our discussion, and certainly not least, we have Dr. Troy Brennan, the Executive Vice President of CVS Caremark, who offer his insights on how to further strengthen the linkage between health insurance coverage and quality improvement, providing specific suggestions for making effective delivery and coverage reforms. Uh, talk about the forefront of the healthcare delivery system. We're focusing on not just uh, pharmaceutical management, but a broader healthcare 
um, uh, focused on quality and value, all of whom I think will be extraordinary um, contributors to our process. And with that, yes, I thought I did. Now Matt's making me feel even worse, but I think I took care of everyone. So thank you all for coming. And if we'll just go down, we'll just go down the aisle, and then we'll open up a question. Mark, did you want to have any open remarks? Okay, we'll just start. Thank you so much for being here today. <coughs> <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> I'm sure some of my remarks will be repetitive, but I'm going to deliver them anyway. Um, I have spent some 50 years in some form or the other of health care, and in recent years, after being away from day-to-day -day involvement, I began to more clearly see our present system. So whatever criticism I have of the system, I direct it toward myself. But I'm convinced that it'll take a major event to reform health care, and maybe the financial meltdown that we just had may be the event. What I've realized is that we don't really have a system, rather one of freestanding silos, which has already been discussed today with very little connectivity among, among them. In essence, we do not have a comprehensive, cohesive approach. We have not defined what we want. We have failed to define a floor as to basic coverage, nor what the top side should be. We have not defined or created a clear system of incentives. Bottom line, we do not have a rational system. For many years, we've had incremental changes with conflicting messages and incentives. Our current system is unsustainable. Healthcare costs are continuing to rise and more people are becoming uninsured. We spend twice as much as any other industrialized nation per person on health care, but we rank 37th in terms of quality and leave one out of six Americans uninsured. I recently started, as it was mentioned, a new organization called Shout America to bring awareness to young people about the impending health care crisis and how it will affect their future. Because unfortunately, there's very, very little incentive for my generation to reform health care. To be honest, we're pretty happy with what we have. Unless we reform the system soon, the younger generation will be in trouble. What are some of the main problems today with today's delivery system that are contrib uh, contributing to rising health care costs? First, for too long, we have had a system that sells sickness instead of wellness. Anyone can look around American society and see that we as a whole are unhealthy by simply considering the obesity epidemic. For example, if you were to ask many company executives what his or her greatest asset, most of them would say their employees. Yet they will allocate resources annually to maintain their infrastructure and equipment, but they won't allocate resources to maintain their greatest asset, their employees. As I like to say, we'll fix someone's broken leg, but we won't fix the steps that broke it. Employers, providers, payers, consumers of health care all need to start thinking more about prevention. I can promise you much cheaper to keep someone healthy than to fix them once they're unhealthy. Right now, it's said that 20 percent, 20 percent of our population is spending 80 percent of health care dollars. So when is enough enough? We need to develop an integrated model of care which would include neighborhood health, preventative medicine, and information technology system that links pharmacy to, ra to labs, to radiology, to billing, to improve efficiency and provide a continuum of care for patients being treated, such as was discussed by Dr. Jacobson, J Jacobson at uh, Vanderbilt and also Dr. Perlin at VA. Unfortunately, we have a system that doesn't want you to get well, nor does it want you to die because at some point, no further revenue can be generated. I don't think I ever went to Washington in my career to talk about health care reform. I always went to get more money. And usually we did. And you know what? We figured out how to spend it. In America, we have a consumption problem. There are a lot of unnecessary care in our system, which again has been mentioned today. Health care today is always follow the dollar. We have a lot of entities that make a great deal of money off the current system. This will present a major barrier to change. Changes will not come 
will not be easy as we have been down this similar path for the last 25 or 30 years, especially during presidential election cycle. The question is whether we have the will to do something this time around. Finally, we need to take a long view on health care reform. We have, we have to figure out where we want to be in 10 years, and we have to start creating solutions to get there. And I'm not talking about incremental changes over a 10-year period. I'm talking about a major transition happening over, a, over this period and well beyond the next election. If we don't find those solutions, the health care system, one day in the not too distant future, will be one getting bailed out with government taking over, taking control of the industry. If you think this financial crisis is bad, the health care crisis will be just as bad. In fact, I thought the meltdown in health care would be the first to happen. In closing, I truly believe that the stars are lined up this time for meaning, meaningful change. But I have said this for the last 25 or 30 years, but we need to stay focused on what that change may ultimately be. Over 20 years ago, I wrote an article titled, Healthcare on the Brink of Change. It ended like this, and, Doc, and, and Senator Baker mentioned this as well. We are an ingenious nation of inventors and entrepreneurs. We are certainly capable of creating a healthcare system that provides basic, affordable health care for all Americans. To do that, we need government assistance, not government intervention. We need enlightened decision makers who will work together to create a health care system that is fair and beneficial to all the players and which will guarantee our heritage as the fairest and most compassionate of all nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Jennings, Dr. McClellan, um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I think of um, my role uh, on behalf of the state of Tennessee as a purchaser of health care. We purchase, we're the largest purchaser of health care in the state. Uh, we purchase for uh, some 1.6 million people and provide care to several thousands of others more directly through some of our uh, clinics and uh, institutions. Um, but, uh, you know, 1.2 million of those people are in our 10 care program. And I was asked to talk a little bit about history uh, there just from my perspective. And, and I think um, another panelist here today, Tony Garr, will have a different perspective than I do. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think there are a number of things that we do agree on. Um, 10 care strengths became its weaknesses. Um, it moved 800,000 people and created an expansion population into managed care in one fell swoop. And managed care at the time is kind of what we thought we now talk about when we talk about patient-centered medical home, is what I think a lot of people thought we were buying when we got that, as opposed to kind of managed cost or managed price. Um, several service areas, including mental health and public clinics, were moved from uh, state-only funds into uh, federal matching funds. Uh, management of services was put under managed care organizations and consolidated in an effort to try and rationalize, again, kind of the spectrum of care. Uh, providers were required to accept TenCare if they did business with the state employee health plan. Um, that kind of guaranteed a broader access um, to uh, a broader array of providers. The, effort, the idea was to try to erase the distinction between public health care and private health care. Um, in original design, it was to remove the previous Medicaid limits on care, um, to uh, rely on managed care to provide the appropriate level of care. Um, and to bring in uninsurable adults and the uninsured. Um, the maximum population at the time was considered to be about 25% of the total state population that could be covered. It solved a budgetary problem for the state also of about a half a, million, uh, half a billion dollars. Um, Tennessee, through the use of provider uh, taxes, had increased its effective match rate to above 80%. And um, it's kind of, there was a, a kind of a balloon note that needed to be covered, if you will. And uh, the, the financial uh, consolidation of these services and the additional federal matching funds allowed that to be covered. Um, the weaknesses, though, became with the movement of the entire population, that took place in 60 days, um, which was pretty remarkable. Uh, due to the budgetary requirements, um, the delays in CMS approval and the budgetary requirements of getting it in place in January 1. Uh, many of the MCOs were inexperienced, did not have the systems or the ability to manage 
the care even if they had had an adequate amount of time to, uh, to get started. Um, while the transfer to federal funding um, allowed for the expansion of services, the public safety net um, was l allowed to atrophy. Uh, the consideration was, well, we're covering everybody, so we don't have to actually keep a, a public safety net system in place. Um, mental health services really shifted from community-based care to institutional care in many ways because of the um, uh, uh, preference in the managed care system for institutional-based care in some ways. Um, and the providers became obviously deeply resentful of the cram down, as they called it, the requirement to see 10 care patients, and the scars from that are with us today. The removal of all limits and the reliance on MCOs to then provide the most cost-effective care were overridden by their own inabilities, by court agreements, and a medical appeals process that, uh, frankly, was uh, very one-sided um, in terms of, of how it was uh, accomplished. Um, MCOs were unable to keep medical expenses within the capitation, necessitating going to back to an ASO type of um, arrangement. Pharmacy cost, in particular, soared to $2.5 billion. Um, we were leading the country in the number of prescriptions per person per year, thanks to West Virginia. We're now number two. Um, enrollment of the adult uninsured was closed after the first year. Um, and uh, the only really way you got in there was into the program, was either uh, rolling off of TANF or um, into uh, 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 by being uninsurable, declared uninsurable. Um, the increased reliance on FMAP tied the hands of the state in its ability to deal with problems because the removal of one state dollar had such severe effects on the provision of services. Um, and, and the states are subject to the kinds of economic downturns that we're currently enjoying. Um, annual increases required for 10 care were taking a disproportionate share of the state dollars that were needed for also for education, for prisons, for courts, for all the other things that people expect state governments to do. Efforts to deal with the budgetary problems were resisted uh, by the advocates, by the plaintiffs in the court cases that we had, uh, requiring the state to take less nuanced measures uh, to get expenditures under control. So what should we have done differently? Well, obviously a whole lot of things, and I think one of the things that we think about the current debate is whether we go ahead and do things now or whether we um, kind of wait for something that's a little, uh, for something to be built. Um, the quick startup within experienced MCOs was obviously a problem. The program had seven directors in eight years. Um, lack of management structure uh, was in place. Um, we've now managed to get the program back to a managed care capitation system. Um, in the process of implementing that statewide now, and we have an excellent staff that actually that does a wonderful job of running this program. All Medicaid programs suffer from a lack of flexibility, as we all well know, um, and whether from CMS or courts or whatever. And the consent decrees that we had really tied to our hands. So what are the lessons that we can learn? Well, in my opinion, again, build carefully, starting with the necessary infrastructure to manage health care. Uh, that would be primary care. Um, health IT, quality measurement. I don't know how we change an entire system effectively if we don't, aren't able to measure and know what it is we're actually accomplishing. Um, and right now, in my opinion, I don't think we do. Um, we have to build at a level where people can work together. Uh, national top-down reforms kind of scare me, um, frankly, as the person who's gonna be stuck on the implementation end of the stick. Um, and um, and uh, it worries me that, in fact, we would, we would not have the kinds of uh, uh, buy-in that we need in order to uh, make something occur. Don't overpromise. build trust, um, have achievable first goals, um, give flexibility to correct for unintended consequences because they will occur uh, just from any implementation. And don't repeat the mistakes of Medicaid, refusal to require people to take responsibility for their own health care, uh, cumbersome procurement processes that prevent best contractors, um, eligibility categories that deny care for those who need it often the most. Um, with that, I think, the, again, the appropriate federal role is to set standards, provide technical assistance, drive adoption of best practices um, on funding. States are, frankly, not capable, given the natures of their different tax structures, of funding this um, on their own. Um, we can do a lot to try and experiment. We can bring together good people and have some, some good thoughts and ideas. But uh, there has to be a substantial um, federal role in the funding of this. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, 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 many questions come to mind, but I'm going to 
go down the line and then we're going to open it up again <coughs> um, and that leads us to uh, Marlon. Thank you. Uh, we'll be speaking from the point of uh, view from a, an employer. Um, if you're not an employer in the room then you certainly work for one. So uh, what, what, you're, uh, what you're experiencing is no different than what we're experiencing. Everybody knows what's happening with the economy today. My industry, the automotive industry, is uh, being particularly hard hit. Uh, so uh, we're getting renewed focus. Uh, I, I got, actually got a call on Thanksgiving Day uh, to talk about uh, some labor costs. So you can imagine uh, what's happening in our industry. I imagine it's happened to you too. Um, so I'm going to save part of my time and, and not go into what all we're facing, but uh, more talk about uh, my personal experience with 19 years with Nissan. I spent five years with um, the manufacturing, I'm sorry, spent five years in the, the uh, finance division, 12 years in manufacturing, and I spent uh, almost three years uh, in the headquarters. So I got to see all walks of life from, from uh, you know, technicians, from people that uh, frankly struggle with understanding the system to people that should know the system inside and out. And what I found is uh, where our expertise is making cars and trucks. We don't want to be in the healthcare business, but because of the nature of what's happening, we have to be. And we're, we're becoming uh, experts uh, as we speak, um, and, and partially out of uh, survival. Um, labor cost is one of the elements that we look at. There's a lot of costs that uh, go into making uh, cars and trucks. There's a lot of elements that come into play. Healthcare is one of those elements. Is it the only element? No. Is it the largest element? No. But it is a significant element. And I can look from a quality perspective. Uh, when a part comes into our plant, I can tell you parts per million, how many we had, where they came from, who put it together, and what time it was put together. And I, I can zero in on any defect at any time. And, uh, but the problem is when they ask me about health care and are we getting the value from health care, I have nothing to go to. I have nothing that can say, yes, we are. Intuitively, we know that, yes, you want healthy employees. That, doesn't take a genius to figure that out. But the reality is I have no way of showing that. And what is the value that we're getting for the money that we're spending? So we've taken some efforts uh, to, to change or to have a, a mind shift change uh, with our employees. And before I get into what we're doing with health care, I want to digress a little bit to what, uh, when I was in manufacturing, I had responsibilities for safety, medical and safety in the plants. And we recognized that uh, most people um, weren't uh, being, you know, major injuries uh, in the plant. It was more cumulative trauma, that sort of thing. So we looked around our industry. We said we want to be better than where we are today. We were in the middle. We weren't uh, the best. We weren't the worst. We looked around our industry. And you know what? We found that everybody was pretty much in the same arena. Nobody was really doing anything outside of what um, we were doing. So we recognized that we had to have a mind shift change. So we went outside of our industry, and I think that's what healthcare is going to have to do too. We often get so buried and so deep into our own understanding that we forget that there are other people that can do things too. Uh, they may not be experts in your field, but they can be experts to, to help you change your mindset. We went to DuPont and Alcoa because they're best. They, they don't make cars and trucks, but you know what? They've got a, a great system around safety. So we took a look at those systems. And we took that mindset back to our employees and we, we customized it to our employees. And uh, I think, uh, Dr. King, you may have uh, said something earlier about transformation. We had to transform the way people thought about uh, uh, safety. People expected in heavy manufacturing that you're going to have cumulative trauma. But we said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to decrease our loss time ratio. We're going to really focus on this. We had to get our managers, much like you have to get your physicians, to look at things differently. And once we did that and, and we had a mindset change, that was the main obstacle. Once the mindset changed, everybody followed suit. The numbers followed with it. It was really the different way of, of thinking. And so by going to the outside, uh, we, we changed our thinking. So we've shifted that to, to focus on our health care as well. We're doing um, a total replacement plan January 1 uh, of consumer-driven health plan with an HRA and an HSA. And, but we're doing something different along with that. I mean, I can just shift cost and I can just change the plan, but we're really transforming the way that people are thinking about health care. And, and if I ask you, um, how many of you, when you go and buy a car, buy a Nissan, of course, um, <laughs> when you go buy one, you want to know about all the options. You can go and find out about how much the car costs to the penny on the Internet. I mean, there's so many things that you can do. And I also had responsibilities for the employee uh, lease vehicle program and, and purchase program. I had a lot more people come and talk to me about what options they should get and what color they should get and all these fun things. Nobody was asking me about health care. Well, I'm glad to report that that has now changed. 
because we now have a focus on uh, consumerism, people are starting to ask those questions, asking questions about, well, how, where do I find quality? I don't have all the answers to tell them where to find it yet, but we're working on that. So having that mind shift to change is being effective, but what we're doing is we're, we're changing our focus from <coughs> treating illness to a focus on wellness. Prevention's covered at 100 percent. We're integrating disease management. We're integrating the wellness. We've got on-site facilities. Even in this time that everybody's cutting and slashing, we're still putting our money where our mouth is and saying we want healthy employees. And, and initially, from a safety perspective, everybody has to wear safety gloves. Everybody has to wear safety glasses. You have to, on the main aisle of the plant, there's a sectioned off uh, area for people to walk. People initially were, had different habits, and they didn't want to do that. And you would think, well, it's safety you naturally want to do it. Well, it's your health care, you naturally want to do it. Well, yes and no. We know what we're supposed to do. We know we're not supposed to eat some of those chocolate chip, chip cookies that are back there, <laughs> but we still have them there and some of them are missing. Uh, so <laughs> so the, the reality is they, people they were need oatmeal. that incentive. Pardon? They were oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the reality is people need some, some type of incentive to help them get where they need to be. And so that's what we're doing uh, with our wellness uh, program, we're really focusing on and rewarding people that are helping to take care of themselves. Thank you very much. I, uh, we had gone back and forth because I messed up the order, but I think I will just go ahead and stick the, on the line that we have. And Tony, Tony if you would just... Um, kick us off, and we'll go. We'll, we'll go back to the consumer panel after uh, we, we hear uh, from Robert. But you start. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Tony Gar with the Tennessee Healthcare Campaign. Uh, it, one of the, the major things that I think our society has not addressed is the role of government, and where does that where does that fit in? And that's what I would like to talk about because I think that was was one of the downfalls of the Ten Care program is that was never really totally defined. Um, I think, first of all, the government's really got to say, and I say the federal government, has got to say that people have a right to health care. Health care is a right that all citizens should have as an American. And I think once we do that, then we decide, you know, that it can't be taken away. I mean, things are so random from state to state. Someone's got to say, federal government's got to say, people have a right to health care. It's not something that uh, you can have because you can afford it or you can't have because you cannot afford it. I think uh, in trying to decide, you know, how does a public sector and the private sector work together, I think there are, there are four things that I've identified that I think are crucial to trying to help these, these uh, sectors work together. Uh, and I think what is instructive is the S-CHIP program and the crowd out. In the S-CHIP, which is State Children's Health Insurance Program, I think the biggest debate was over crowd out in regards to, you know, at what point does the public sector play, what, what, what point does the public sector cover people and the private sector should be covering that? Where does that take place at? And I think that, that as we go, as we look at this, we've got to define that we need some direction. I think state needs some direction, and I think that's the biggest bone of contention. For, I mean, currently the public programs focus on individuals and not families. Uh, it's really, I mean, you can look at TenCare as a Medicaid, you can literally find one person, one child might be on Medicaid because of what they call the PLIS, Poverty Level Income Standard. Another child might be on Cover Kids. The mother might be on TenCare because of breast cancer. And the father may have insurance through their employer. I mean, literally, I mean, you're talking about a mess and trying to manage that. Families trying to manage their health care when they've got four different family members on four different plans. And that happens. And it's happening in Tennessee, and I'm sure it's happening in, in other parts of the country as well. So uh, we've got to focus on families and not individu individually. Because right now, when you look at Medicaid, it's, it's categorical eligibility, but it's per individual, per child, the age of that child. Uh, the disease of the mother having breast or cervical cancer. So it's very categorical, very individual. And we need to think in terms of how can we put the family in a plan as opposed to put the individual in a plan. Uh, and then we have the, the, the contention between the public sector putting up, uh, it's got to put up barriers because it's got to control its cost. And so it will put up barriers by eligibility as far as who can come in and who can go out. So you've, you've got these barriers that the public sector builds in. And then you also have these barriers that the private sector builds in. Private sector only wants to cover healthy people. 
they don't necessarily want to cover people who are sick. And so you've got these barriers, and usually the people who are really uh, lose out are people who are in the middle, and who really are sort of on the, on the edge of being able to afford or having employment. Uh, Roy Bess, who some of you all might know, was uh, a Deputy Commissioner for Department of Commerce and Insurance. I worked with Roy Bess for about seven years on the High Risk Pool Board. And one of the things that Roy and I always just had some good discussion about is, you know, at what point is, is, there, is insurance a social program and what, at what point is it a private program? And so he looked upon uh, at what point does the high risk pool become a social program and what does it, when is it a private program? Affordability and access. I think this is really another key issue. When you look at the health savings accounts and those other issues that uh, are out there, tax credits, they really work really well for people who maybe are middle, upper middle to higher income and people who are relatively healthy, but they really don't work very good for people who are lower income. And we've got to recognize that. So we're talking about two-thirds of the people who are uninsured in this country are either poor or they're near poor. And tax credits and health savings accounts don't work for those folks. And I think studies are now bearing that out. So there's got to be some other solution. Once again, the government's, we as a society got to figure out where does the government step in and where does the government let the private sector take over? Uh, the government's got to define a basic benefit plan uh, that is for all Americans. So until we decide that, we really can't get there either. So I think those four points from my standpoint or from the cons consumer standpoint are important for us to address. Thank you. Robert, thank you for being with here. Yeah. Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to participate. and. Um, to talk about an, an insurer's perspective. Uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Tennessee um, believes it's our responsibility to play a leadership role in the ongoing efforts to improve healthcare quality and value. And we're approaching this in a variety of ways. Um, one thing, I mean, insurers represent an integrating point in the healthcare system, and we play a key role in facilitating the relationship between the various components of the system. Um, the, the providers and their patients or customers are our members, and to a great extent, uh, or to some extent, we represent the interests of those actually paying for care and by proxy hold the delivery system accountable for its performance uh, with respect to quality and, uh, and value. Um, we know fundamentally that coverage is a critical gateway to access. We've talked about that already, um, and that cost is a, a critical component of being able to afford coverage. So improving the efficiency of care, Eliminating waste, both clinical and administrative, leads to, lower, slower, leads to slower increases in cost and improves coverage opportunities, and we uh, are working on that. And access, in turn, leads to more opportunities for, for preventive care, more timely management of chronic disease, uh, which reduces expensive acute care uh, episodes and then improves outcome um, and affordability, which, again, then gives more opportunity for coverage. So it's that circle that I think we've talked about. Um, as we think about how to help or uh, contribute to that, we have aggressively developed a variety of affordable plans for individuals and small businesses to increase access. Uh, we've worked closely with the state of Tennessee uh, in their Cover Tennessee program, one of Governor President's innovative programs designed to provide low-cost, limited benefit coverage to the working poor. And that's enrolled over 17,000 people and has had uh, an impact here in Tennessee. In 2005, uh, Blue Cross created Shared Health, which is now the nation's largest health information exchange. It houses clinical records for over 3 million uh, uh, people in Tennessee, including the state's Medicaid members and our commercial members. And it's provided the opportunity for us to partner with the state and other payers in delivering uh, and supporting clinicians in delivering more effective and efficient care. So Shared Health provides clinical information decision support tools at the point of care, allowing um, providers to identify gaps in care and identify preventive care opportunities, to eliminate duplicate services, to order prescriptions and identify potential drug interactions and improve patient compliance. Um, so I think those are all important components of improving quality um, and efficiency, and which I think, again, leads to affordability. In addition to what we've done in partnership with others, we've also done things on our own to, to contribute to this. Uh, we've established a number of evidence-based medical management programs to promote quality and efficiency. Uh, we've 
collaborated with uh, major employer groups and the provider community to create a physician quality and cost program uh, based on the NCQA standards for transparency. This has created a better or more productive dialogue between members and clinicians and is also helping members make more informed decisions as they become personally more responsible for uh, uh, more of the care, uh, costs of care. And we've also begun a, a pay for performance program that provides incentives for meter, meeting or exceeding national benchmarks and quality measures. Um, our Health Foundation has supported uh, the Tennessee Center for Patient Safety, which is focused on improving or enhancing surgical care in Tennessee. So I think, um, and, and I think what we're doing, uh, although some of what we're doing is unique, but other insurers play a similar role in other parts of the country. And I think as we look to the future, insurers will increasingly be demanding accountability from the delivery system and will play a role in that. And I think we'll do that by a number of things that have been mentioned already, but by changing the way we pay for care so that we're not paying for volume and intensity, but are paying for outcomes and, um, and, and quality. Uh, that we will change benefit designs and create innovative benefit designs that align incentives that create greater engagement on the part of patients with um, their providers and with employers uh, so that ultimately we're encouraging more engagement in healthy living and not just in the healthcare system. Um, we will be uh, collaborating and supporting providers in trying to address the issues of misuse, overuse, and underuse. And finally, um, continuing to pro promote transparency, which I think um, needs to, uh, will help foster continuous improvement as well as informed decision making and in greater engagement of all the stakeholders uh, in the system. So. Those. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. And, and Patrick, I'm going to ask you to come up and, I mean, to, to speak as you will. But I, I do want to make the point, um, in 2001, uh, we reached the, the, the baby boom population. Um, the start of the baby boom population was 55. They were just starting to age in. We are now in the midst of the baby boom population, the 50 to 64. Um, uh, cohort in a major, major way, and it has enormous implications for um, health uh, reform uh, and access. And I'm, I think that's you're going to be addressing this issue somewhat. Thank you very right. much. Yeah, um, AARP of course represents uh, uh, 40 million uh, members who are are 50 plus, and, and today I'm going to talk about those on the younger end of the scale who are who are currently boomers. Um, my job on this panel is to speak um, for the consumer, the end user of health care, and consumers have a responsibility to improve the system. In the future, more will be expected of them, and it's important for consumers to live healthy lifestyles and make informed decisions about their health care, and we acknowledge that. But getting to the point where value reigns supreme will require a lot of people to change the way they do a lot of things. Providers and purchasers, all stakeholders, also bear responsibility as we work to enhance the value of healthcare services and make our system more effective. We share the responsibility and we share accountability. But let's consider the perspective that consumers bring to healthcare reform. Increasingly, they are concerned about cost. About one in four, 24 percent, has skipped a recommended test or treatment in the past year to save money, according to a recent poll by the Kaiser Family Foundation. That figure is up from 17% in 2005. Now at AARP, we decided to join together with partners for an effort called Divided We Fail, where we brought together the largest business group in the Business Roundtable, the largest small business group in the National Federation of Independent Business, and the largest union in SEIU to emphasize health care reform and the need for health care reform. We began this shortly before the Bipartisan Policy Center was created uh, a couple of years ago. And at that time, we began also asking our members for some of their stories about what was going on for them. And one of those that we got in Tennessee was from a woman in Hendersonville named Mary. She's a diabetic uh, who has high cholesterol and high blood pressure, and she is currently sticking with her current insurance because she has no other choices. Here's what she wrote to us. She said, I'm depleting my savings at a rate so staggering I can hardly breathe. I can't believe I'm nearing age 62 and wishing the next three years of my life away so that I can get Medicare at 65. And so I wait. Wait that a terrible illness may cause me to lose my home that thankfully is paid for. Wait for my savings to run out. Wait to die before the money runs out. 
or wait to turn 65 so I can breathe again. And that's the group that we're concerned about here because it is certainly a quiet crisis that we're facing here. You could uh, do as much as look at yesterday morning's uh, Tennessean where there was a front page story called Seniors Face Gap in Health Insurance Before Medicare Coverage is Costly. And in that story, we can find that nationwide, 17% of the 50 to 64-year-olds said they were uninsured or had at some point been uninsured in the previous year. That was according to a survey by the Commonwealth Fund. The number of people rose from 6.9 million in 2003 to 8.9 million in 2007. And in addition, there were 18% in the same age group who said that they were uninsured, meaning they had coverage, but it didn't protect them fully against rising medical costs. So for these people, being a boomer is a bummer. Now what we found at AARP is that the effectiveness of any of the proposals that is coming along to expand coverage in the private market will depend largely on whether the reforms take into account the cost of private coverage relative to low family incomes of the uninsured 50 to 64, and also the restrictive practices of the individual insurance markets in the state. Research has shown that this is a crucial age group because this is the time when the people really need to start thinking about their health care. This is the time when they see the effects of health care, and this is what needs to happen. We also know that this is a group that is increasing. In 2000, this accounted for about 15% of the population. But what we know is that by 2015, it is going to rise to 20% of the population. That's one in five of the population in this country is going to be between 50 and 64 in this country. So it's a growing number, and we need to address it and find a way to address it. Research has shown that the uninsured are at increased risk of premature death and have greater declines in health status than those with continuous coverage and that the health of the uninsured in this age group could benefit most because of the increased likelihood that they will need services. Now, at AARP, we appreciate the work of the Bipartisan Policy Center in raising health care as an issue, and we have worked with you to raise this as a discussion for the incoming Congress. One of the things, one of the pieces of good news out there is that it looks like the new Congress is ready to address it, as Senator Baker said. And one of the first proposals out of the chute that has come from the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee has addressed the issue of providing some form or some way to get insurance for that age group in 55 to 64. We see this as a great opportunity to continue that discussion, and we look forward to it in the years and months ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, Cynthia, thank you for joining us today to speak about a all too often forgotten population, uh, those of the mentally ill. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, tremendous strides have been made in reducing the burden of disease and extending life and advancing new medical treatments to improve the health and quality of life for millions of Americans. There have been steady increases in life expectancy and quality of life new technologies have played a crucial role. In my own life, this played out with my mother, who had first depression probably at the age six, seven, eight. Um, unusually young, but not unusual in my family. Um, she got her first relief when she was my age, and the new selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors became available, and she was on a clinical trial of one of them, and she said to me, it's as if the dark veil has lifted. I said, how long has it been there, mother? She said, I don't remember when it wasn't. Contrast my daughter, after the birth of her third child, she had a crashing clinical depression. First medicine didn't work. The doctor said, anybody in your family successfully treated? Yes. Grandmother, what did she take? I don't know, but I'll find out. Bingo. It worked. Contrast her daughter. The first sign we understood it, we got to the doctor. She got the medicine. She got the psychotherapy. She got the... Um, peer support, the family support. She's a spectacularly successful high school sophomore now. Great. Okay, everybody can get what they need? No, no. There's three groups of people who do not have access to these kinds of advances. The first one, 47 million individuals and families who are uninsured. They can't afford it or they can't get it because they have a pre-existing condition. Jessica can't get mental health treatment insurance because she is successfully treated for a, an illness which can be managed. What happens is that people delay care, 
They end up in the emergency room. A child who, who should get a cold treated ends up with pneumonia. There's little or no preventative care in that scenario. There is no continuity. The quality is very poor. The health outcomes are very bad. And lots more chronic conditions develop. A simple case of a cold may turn into an asthma, which turns into a lifelong condition. Now, there's about 25 million underinsured people. They have less, comp less um, comprehensive coverage than they need, uh, higher out-of-pocket costs, those kinds of limits. What happens to them? The same thing. They forego, heart, uh, forego the coverage that they need, put it off, get it later, uh, end up in a crisis situation, S same scenario plays out. The third group of people are people with insurance, but the healthcare professionals aren't available. They're in a rural area. How do we fix this? How do we fix it? Well, I'm very proud uh, that Dr. McClellan is a, a leader in something called the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease. Um, they have some opportunities that they present to us. More than 133 million Americans suffer for one or more chronic conditions, things like asthma, cancer, diabetes, mental illness. The vast majority of these cases could be better managed or even prevented. These chronic illnesses are the number one cause of death and disability in the United States. Number one. Okay, what does that have to do with how our system is organized? Think about one thing, obesity. Between 1987 and today, the increase in our health care cost, about 30% of it, was due to the increase in obesity. Do we address that adequately in our health care system? No. Think about the aging population we have, Alzheimer's. If we would, in, in the next five years, delay the onset of Alzheimer's, delay, not stop it, delay, we could save $100 billion a year. $100 billion a year. Do we do that? No, we wait until somebody's very, very sick. They go in to see the doctor, uh, and they're at the, at the place of needing care. Well, it's too late then to stop it back where it was when it was first available. Um, I have to say just one more thing about mental illness. Uh, we have the highest prevalence rate of mental illness in the world compared to 14 develop, develop and developing countries. Let me say that again, the highest prevalence of mental illness in the world in a comparison with 14 developed and developing countries. 26%. One in four or one in five of us will have it. Um, mental illness account for five of the ten leading causes of disability, and yet we don't look for it early and we don't treat it. We need to integrate our system. We need to better coordinate care for, for people who suffer from chronic conditions. We need to treat the head as well as the rest of the body. We need information technology. We need to focus on things like obesity. We need to accelerate the de development of new medical advances and we need to have access for all, regardless of pre-existing conditions. Thank you, Cynthia. Now, Dr. Brennan, you now have, you're certainly not least, but you are last. So if you can just take care of all the problems with one prescription, we really would appreciate that. Thank you for being here today. I'm fully aware I should get done quickly here. Um, I, you know, and I would just uh, make a few comments from the point of view of uh, somebody who's kind of in between. I used to work for provider organizations, then I worked for health plan, now I work for something, CVS Caremark, which is kind of in between a provider and um, a health plan. And so I'll return back to my academic days when I was relatively irresponsible. I made a series of predictions in these editorials I was writing in the late 90s, all of which have become completely false because um, I was wrong on all of them, um, except for one which hasn't occurred yet. And that was an article I wrote back in a journal called Inquiry back in 1998 in which I said that health care reform would occur in 2012 uh, or in 2008. And I'm returning to this sort of the very beginning of today's conversation about health policy reform. And the reasoning behind that was closely related to the reasoning 
um, around uh, what we were talking about with regard to the baby boomers is that the height of the baby boomers, actually my little brother who's born in 1957 and he turned 65 in 2022. And Bob Blendon, who's probably working with Sheila, talking to the um, uh, uh, Congress people who are coming in, uh, says that people start to vote like their Medicare recipients um, about 10 years before they go into Medicare. So 2022 minus 10, 2012. Now, why would we get health care reform then? Well, it's because all of those people would be seeing around them, at least from a perspective of 1998, put another 14 years of inflation in place a system which was basically out of control in terms of costs and a potentially impoverished Medicare system. So if it's impoverished, you probably need to drag everybody into the same risk pool with you. And so that's why we received reform in 2012. I also hypothesized then that we would be a second term Democrat would be in power. So I'm, I'm close as long as we don't get health reform in 2009. Um, but so if it's okay with you, we might just try. <laughs> so. That's okay if you want to make me feel badly about myself. Um, but um, the reason why I don't think we're going to see health care reform is because I don't think that we're dealing yet with the cost drivers. And the cost drivers are really two uh, broken down simply. The first one is sort of specialization, technology, provider induced demand moral hazard, third party payment. We're all aware of how that sort of works. The best example and I was looking for when I got here, uh, Dr. Jacobson, was you go to most academic medical centers today and you look for a big hole. Now there is a big hole right up the street, but I think it looks like more of a condo development that's not taking off rather than the proton beam. Most uh, academic medical centers are putting in a proton beam. Very expensive technology, completely unproven, but uh, under the sort of Cartesian analysis of American healthcare, if you can get somebody to pay for it, you might as well put it in. Um, and that's what happens when you've got this kind of provider induced demand. And we don't have anybody saying anything about that. The second place where the healthcare costs, and we've talked about it a little bit today, is chronic, is chronic illness. And I think of it just in terms of sort of vascular care. I take about sort of 60% of the morbidity I was seen at a hospital I worked at with that, you know, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease. The bottom line about that, those particular ailments is that people don't get the preventive care they need. They don't get any health care promotion. Um, they don't stay on the medications they're supposed to be on. And so as a result of that, we have really high costs associated with that. Dr. King and Dr. Welch would both like to sort of say, we've got people who can take care of that. But right now, we don't see any evidence that anybody's willing to pay those people more uh, in order to take care of it. Now, a rational healthcare system, we'd reverse payment, pay the radiologists and anesthesiologists a lot less, uh, and we'd pay the primary care doctors and nurse practitioners a lot more. And then we'd have somebody who would be sort of addressing chronic disease. But the problem is nobody's really talking about that yet. And I don't see how we can undertake comprehensive health care reform in this country until we start to really address those cost issues. But I am a firm believer in the dead hand of demographics. And it is very clear that we're not going to be able to afford the health care system we've got right now. So what we see, uh, you know, we'll get some comparative effectiveness. We'll get some support for IT. Maybe we'll get some moves about how we sort of redo the ruck in order to change physician payment. But uh, I think real health care reform is going to have to wait until we get more of a consensus about the real problems around cost. Well, on that up, uh, note, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I, I think you raise very, I mean, I would say that that is uh, very, very, there would be a broad-based belief in many places around Washington that that's, that's the case. Um, and I think what the Bipartisan Policy Center is really working towards doing is rather than pick the year in which the final legislation gets enacted to help create the vision for where we need to be when, whenever that time is, whether it's this year or next year or three or four years down the, down the road. And you, as you, as you, once you have that vision, you can talk about phasing in. Uh, but, but let me um, turn it over to Mark and Sheila for any questions, and then I'll supplement. Well, let me just pick up on this one and maybe try to tie the two panels together, just on to, um, Troy's uh, very foresighted 1998 paper in terms of uh, uh, when reform might occur leads to this discussion of what are going to be the main drivers of reform. And we heard on the first panel, I think, a lot of agreement with the 
statements that you just made about the need for uh, changes in delivery that focus much more on value and about the need for changes in delivery that create a team approach for more effective prevention and uh, more coordinated management of chronic diseases and even some examples of how this could be done, and I thought I heard some real willingness all down the panel for being held accountable for that. that you know, instead of being paid for volume, as I think Jonathan put it, uh, uh, change the way that payments work, change the way that benefits work, to put much more of an emphasis on directly addressing the two core drivers that you were talking about. Let me ask this panel, and if, I, if that's roughly correct from what you all said, let me ask this panel over here if uh, you see a path for building public support for the kinds of insurance and coverage reforms that could incorporate those kinds of changes. And I want to go back to something that David mentioned about the, um, the, the ten care experience when you know what you thought you were doing was creating medical homes in exactly this sort of model, but, but that wasn't what it was. It was managed price, it was managed cost, and we now have a public that's very skeptical about any efforts that would do something to reduce health care costs because they think it's going to translate into less access to care that they really need as opposed to better care. How do you overcome that kind of skepticism? and bring us closer to the, uh, the, the uh, kinds of reforms that the first panel talked about maybe before 2012 on uh, Troy's time schedule. Well, I don't think you can turn a switch and, and, and flip the payment system on its head, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Brennan said, but I, I, I do think that's where you'd go to gradually, is you, people have to be convinced that, in fact, they're getting the quality of care that they want and expect through a system where they didn't have to see a doctor. When they, when they went in, but they knew that the doctor oversaw their care and that they were in fact receiving a quality of care uh, and an interaction that improved their quality of life. Uh, and I think that's, and that's what Marlin's trying to do with his, with his health care system changes, that he's trying to implement at Nissan. It's what we want to do with a state employee health plan. Um, it, it, it's going to take uh, some convincing. Uh, to get people to actually, you know, put down the, the, the oatmeal cookie and uh, uh, to uh, get out and exercise. But uh, th that's what we've got to do. Um, I wonder, David and Tony, this is really for the two of you. Um, I'm interested in the tension between the feds and the state. Uh, some of what we've heard talked about today uh, presumes, I suspect, a, an intervention on the part of the federal government in terms of either the development of standards uh, with respect to insurance, the uh, implementation of rules governing insurance, whether it has to do with guarantee issue uh, or any of the kinds of insurance reforms that we've had talked about. Uh, we talked a little bit about, Tony, you talked about some of the uh, challenges with the multiplicity of programs that deal with the low income and how we don't deal with a family, we deal with an individual, and that is a function essentially of what's occurred in the development of those programs, whether it was the decision by a state to go with CHIP as a separate program rather than running it through its Medicaid program. Tell me what you would imagine to be the reaction on the part of states um, as we look through some of the reforms that have been suggested, whether it is the development of a purchasing pool, whether it is the implementation of rules that govern insurance in terms of insurance reforms, uh, whether it is a greater emphasis on the expansion of the Medicaid program as we know it to a certain minimum level, everyone under 100% and get rid of this sort of single childless couple exclusion. What do you imagine to be the state reaction? to that kind of pressure as we look at reforms and try and balance this federal-state partnership that has been challenged at times uh, in our past as we've looked at efforts at reform. I'll go ahead and take a stab at that. Uh, well, I, I think, first of all, the system is so complicated, I mean the Medicaid system is so complicated, that there's a general perception of the public that it's unfair and the government doesn't know what it's doing. You know, why d does the system cover one person who has breast cancer and doesn't cover someone else with some other very chronic disease? And, and the perception of the public is that this system is unfair, it doesn't work, the government doesn't know what it's doing. So I, I think there's got to be a floor. And the floor might be 150% of poverty. 
automatically 150 percent of poverty everybody's covered under some kind of Medicaid type 10 care program so there's got to be a floor let's get rid of the 40 something categories of eligibility in, in Medicaid and let's have one category if you're below a certain income level you're eligible so I think we've got to do that to build up uh, some trust that the government knows what it's doing it's like uh, it's like uh, the private sector offering uh, 200 choices of health insurance uh, for people who are trying to make a choice they don't want 200 choices they want maybe 12 choices I mean uh, the Medicare Part D uh, is an example of you know people are so there's so many choices they're just totally confused and people want choices but they don't want 50 choices you know give me 10 good choices and I'll find the plan I need uh, in regards to after we set a floor as far as who's covered by some kind of state federal matching arrangement then I think David is right in the sense that we need more assistance from the federal government in other words the current match rate won't get it done so there needs to be a, a sort of enhanced match rate for states expanding so. right so those are my sort of brief comments what about all the insurance well I mean, this is an historic tension between the feds and the states in terms of who governs insurance either the design or the the sale of insurance and the rules that govern that insurance? If, in fact, you know, one of the approaches is going to be some change in tax treatment mm -hmm. um, as, as part of these, I don't see how you avoid um, setting a common level of insurance regulation across the states. And some of my friends, and I've seen them in the audience, going to probably slap me when I leave here. Um, but I, I honestly don't see how you do that because I think you do have the ability for people to game where they're domiciled or to game, uh, you, know, wh you know, what goes on. Uh, now, exactly how the pooling should be constructed, I think, is is open to a lot of debate and needs to be a lot of discussion. Exactly what, how the reform and what individual policies could and could not do. Um, I think is also needs to be very carefully thought through, which really kind of gets me to the point of kind of the federal state partnership. It really, I, I do believe in incrementalism here. I do believe that in fact we have to be careful. I mean, make states get involved and be real partners in this, okay? And, and don't let them kind of shirk um, their responsibility. I think anyone who's running a state these days anywhere is willing to stand up and take on this issue. They're going to have it whether they, you know, or not. I mean, it's it's they don't really have a choice, but um, and set some 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 real guidelines. But listen, help. I mean, you're going to get better feedback and understanding of of what something is is the effect something is going to have by pushing it through that kind of uh, feedback loop uh, down at the state level or at the local level, but in, in some larger states. Uh, but you will get a better idea and you'll have a better product as a result. It's, it's, it's got to be an experimental approach. Uh, it just in our own implementation of different health care programs and, and, uh, and what we've been doing, the, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy is the old military aphorism, and that's true and certainly true in health care. Could I take a shot at Dr. McClellan's question? I think you've identified a critical issue, and that is the thing that will sell to Congress, which is cost containment, is the thing that will make the public suspicious of you. I mean, we as advocates had to pass laws that said women have to get mammograms on a regular schedule. You know, you can't kick women out of hospitals 24 hours after a baby's born. Cost containment to the public is a bad word. But I also think at the same time, that what will work is also what will sell. The public understands early intervention. They understand prevention. And if they believe that what you are doing in those regards will lead to cost savings, that's OK. They're going to like that. So you can't, you're not going to be able to sell it to the public unless there is an understanding that there's something in it for them. And the thing that's in it for them is health. If we can talk about a health system that really is focused on health outcomes, and it's partly what they were talking about over here, don't pay for everything, pay when you get what you want. I wanted to ask anyone who wants to speak about this, but I think we, we, we've talked a lot about delivery reform changes and financing and coverage, and we've, but, and we've touched on this issue of health rather than health care and the issue of individual responsibility and the issue of uh, diabetes and, and 
maybe touched a little bit about education programs. Do any of you have any recommendations about dealing with that issue well uh, from a policy perspective? Again, I, I want to be clear. I think none of us up here are talking about top down. We're talking about policies that can spur uh, real action here. And uh, sometimes that's just a leader talking about it. Sometimes it's an educational program. Sometimes it's a trans fat tax. Sometimes you, I don't know what it is, but I'd be interested in knowing what you all think might be the best way to deal with health as well as health care in this broader discussion about how we improve uh, health in this country. Chris, <clears throat> back to, uh, to the younger generation. Uh, we found that very few, I mean, they think they'll live 100 years, they're Superman or Superwoman, and healthcare is not on their radar screen. <clears throat> and we really need to begin ed a, a good educational program so that we can prevent some of the chronic diseases that we're talking about that's 75 or so percent of our cost. So uh, it's too late for my generation to get too much prevention done because in the last few years I've been a, re <laughs> you know, a consumer of health care. <clears throat> but I do think we've got some opportunity with the younger generation. And, you know, for the first time, in my lifetime that we we've really got had them involved in this last election now the question is do we keep them involved after the election and i think that's a real challenge uh, i was going to say chris the, one, one of the things that you know from our standpoint of practice is expanding that team as i sit here and listen to the talk that's going on at nissan i need to be going to the people in nissan's all and talk about how can we do this working with you in your plant in my practice because we know that there's really only two things that improve the health of, of our patients one is having health insurance that covers what they need whether it's health whether it's treatment of medical conditions and two having a user, usual source of care a place they know where they can go to get the care they need so with that, with us expanding our team beyond just thinking about the healthcare professionals that we work with, talking with industry and the others, um, you know, the public health, as we expand, how can we do that and work together and, and break down silos and quit reinventing the wheel and doing those things together, whether I'm working with the health council in my county or I'm working with the local industries in a way of providing that thing and making that possible. You know, Chris, I just add to that. Um you know, I think Dr. King is right, but it's kind of a, one of the interesting parts of the debate that's going on right now is, and it's relatively historic, is, is the workplace going to remain sort of central to your health care insurance and your health care provision? And I think, you know, the way that Mr. Chapman outlined it is the way a lot of us would like to think about the, the workplace, which is a place where you can really bring about engagement for people uh, with uh, uh, chronic diseases. Um, but uh, at least some of the proposals, and in fact, I would say the leading proposals, whether you talk about uh, Senator Wyden's proposal, um, or, you know, what's emerging from sort of the Baucus Kennedy people uh, is an expanded Medicare. Both of those would likely, over time, sort of move health care away uh, from the place of employment. And I think that's something for us to really consider, especially on this point you're trying to get at, because I think most people who are thinking about chronic disease, how do you get people engaged? And the workplace is one place to get them engaged. And you lose that, you wonder exactly how you're going to go about it, what's going to be the nidus for that to occur. Well, I think the other thing is that the engagement you're talking about, so we don't really promote or provide incentives for employers to do wellness activities. They can deduct, you know, they, they have a business expense of, for health insurance tax deductible. I'm not sure that they get the same treatment for investing in wellness of their employees, investing in gyms. We don't have any kind of recognition. You know, we have this whole program around green and environmental buildings. We don't have any recognition of employers who really support health uh, in, in, for their employer, for employees. So I think this whole consumer, uh, you know, I think Troy's point about the focus of health I mean, we spend a lot of time, people spend a lot of time at work, and that's a perfect place to engage people about health if their employers really focus on that, and if we can create incentives for employers to focus on health and not just providing health care. Yeah, can I, can I, say can I just, I, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, obviously, we spent most of our capital in the last uh, 50 years investing in resources to deliver acute care. Um, and uh, the, the response 
that you hear all the time about dealing with the rest of the continuum of care is that nobody pays for it and nobody wants to invest in it. And I think the game changer here is to take a look at investments we've already made and resources we already have in place and leverage those. And, you know, I think the employer issue is one. I think schools is another. I think we have to be thinking of, of venues and workforces that are already existing that we can apply to this problem without having to come up with hundreds of billions of dollars of new investment. If I could just add one point. Um, we have a number of faculty nurse practitioners who are placed in plants. Um, and uh, they are basically the plant supplies a room, um, the salary uh, of the nurse practitioner, uh, a little bit of overhead you know, to pay for us. Um, being involved and, um, and, med and, and supplies of medication. But what makes it unique is that it's in the plant, and so you don't lose the productivity time of uh, a person going out to a whatever, a, a, an appointment outside of the plant. But what really makes it unique is that we also see the dependents. They come in to the plant, so they don't have copays. Uh, they don't have uh, un you know useless emergency visits. Uh, we do the football physicals, um, the well baby checks, all of that sort of thing. It's different from the regular kind of quote unquote clinic that you associate with a uh, with a plant, and it's been very successful. And we've been able to demonstrate the dollars and cents saved. And so I think that's an example of incentives. People, if they don't have to use copays. Um, are going to use it, and if a diabetic is at work, they're much more likely to come in down the hall to see the nurse practitioner rather than take the time off uh, to go to a, uh, an office off-site. Colleen, that was a system we had when I was growing up. <laughs> well, we learned from that, Clayton. <laughs> huh. I, I'd say that why well, this is very, very helpful, and I, I I, I guess just to answer your question about the, the direction I think people are going in with employer-based or not, I, I assume what we will see, and one of the lessons learned from 93, 94, and I think maybe even by Senator McCain, maybe not yet Senator Wyden, is that um, that disruption of plans currently in place uh, uh, has uh, foreseen and unforeseen consequences, and I think, and one of the major one might well be political, uh, which is to say, people don't like to lose what they have until they know what they're going to get as an alternative. Um, and I think that, frankly, the, the 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 progression of the debate of those people who are in the middle of it in Washington are starting to get that message. Now, having said that, I think that is does not mean that all employer based uh, uh, locales are the best place to do prevention or well care or whatever because small businesses just aren't going to work that way. Large businesses can. So you really have to be uh, cognizant of the different challenges you have by place of employment and by setting, rural, urban, etc. Um, this is, I didn't ask the question because I had an easy answer, but I just wanted to get some good ones, and we did. So th thank you very much. Mark, did you have one last question before we? No. No? OK. I, 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 this was exactly what we wanted to have some give and take here. And I, this conversation does not end here today. It continues on. Uh, as you saw with Senator Baker, we're very, very honored and privileged to be working with four senators and leaders. Senator Dole, Senator Baker, Senator Daschle, and Senator Mitchell, at least Senator Daschle for as long as he'll have us. Um, we'll keep him as long as he will. Um, that uh, who are completely engaged in this, but first and foremost insisted on a dialogue and a process that really took in specific feedback, um, specific recommendations to inform them. As much as they trust the three of us to provide options, they wanted to hear it themselves. They, they read what we forward them. Um, if you have any other ideas as we go forward, I would strongly encourage you to send it to us. Just to give you a sense of context, we have the month of December really to 
finalize specific recommendations for their consideration uh, to develop a report. The, the hope is that sometime in the next uh, January, February timeframe, we will be releasing an explicit report because we want it to be relevant to the incoming administration and Congress. So it gives you a sense of, is I, even as I'm saying that, how overwhelming we're, uh, a time frame that we're about to get into. But I want to underscore something else, which is to say, we aren't here to say we believe in a Big Bang Theory that it automatically happens all at once. But we do believe that there needs to be a vision, uh, a vision of where you need to go uh, so that you can build appropriately up um, and not mess up the, the house that you're talking about constructing. Uh, and I think the contributions made today were very, very constructive, and very, very helpful. And I know speaking for Senator Baker, uh, we thank you all for coming. And with that, I'll let Mark close out. I don't have much. I don't have much to add to that. I want to thank you all for a terrific discussion. It's picking up on Chris's point about the importance of vision. Uh, that came through very clearly from all of you, that, that we can uh, envision a much better health care system. I think the way Senator Baker put it was, you know, I want computers and doctors and other health professionals uh, all working together uh, uh, to uh, get better care for, for each person and have that kind of innovation that we know our health care system should be capable of for everyone. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about moving towards real teams that are focused on health care, not sick care, uh, towards uh, moving towards uh, focus on health and, uh, and, and personal engagement uh, before people get sick. And I think Jim uh, said something effective, look, you can, you can envision ways to get there that have uh, Colleen and me sitting on the same side of the table, and Marlon for that matter too, all of these uh, different perspectives. We all share the same goals, we just don't have uh, uh, payment and benefits and other feature regulations in our healthcare system that really support it. As Chris also said, we're not envisioning a sudden uh, radical change in order to get there, but uh, rather a path from here to there uh, that can start now and it can bring, uh, uh, can, can reflect the, the views and the, and, uh, the concerns of the public uh, about uh, not getting into a system that restricts access to needed services, about uh, really giving them confidence they can get the best care for their needs and stay well and be engaged. Uh, all of you provided some excellent comments on how to potentially get there, and I uh, deeply appreciate your help. Um, before I wrap up, I just wanted to uh, mention a few more things. Um, Matt Kennedy and, uh, and the rest of the staff for the BPC put in a tremendous amount of work in order to bring this meeting together. It's uh, uh, always a much more logistical effort than you think to put together a, a fine discussion, and I want to thank them for all of their effort. I want to thank Sheila Burke especially for her help in uh, moving this whole project along, giving us some much needed guidance and insights along the way uh, and helping us get the, the most out of our work with all of the, the former majority leaders. And then finally, uh, the, 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 the BPC leaders themselves, as uh, you heard from Senator Baker, uh, view this as a real window of opportunity and one that they will continue to be putting their efforts into taking advantage of. Um, with that in mind, I'd like to remind you that there are comment cards here in the room that uh, uh, out back on the registration table, I guess not in the room, but right next to the room, uh, that we would uh, very much like to hear from you about. Uh, if you have other ideas, questions, comments, suggestions for us in this BPC process, please uh, leave them along with your contact information uh, on the way out. Uh, we also have a mechanism on the, the BPC website at bipartisanpolicy.org for submitting comments electronically and also on the website will be updates on this project as well as access to the papers and uh, events and records produced by the, uh, the, the center's efforts on health reform so far. Uh, so uh, we do have a, a good ways to go to get to that kind of transformed health care system that we all believe is possible, uh, but I think we made a lot of progress in getting there today. And again, thank you for your help and uh, keep in mind as well that there is a reception uh, immediately after we finish here. I hope you'll join us for, uh, for a few refreshments, hopefully the healthy kind Marlin uh, uh, in the foyer after uh, this meeting is adjourned. And I think we're adjourned right now. Thank you all very much.